As you can see, I'm neither Eamon Andrews nor Michael Aspel, and I don't have a flashy studio or a TV-style budget for this act of worship. But we're working our way through Genesis during May and June, and today I thought we might focus on the character who takes centre stage by looking at him through the experiences of those who are close to him, a little like that old TV programme where stars were faced with a gallery of the important people from their lives to say, this is your life. That character is Jacob, and I suspect he would have loved to have been a TV star and to have been presented with that famous big red book. But my name's Jill Baker, a local preacher in the Strathclyde circuit living in Glasgow, and glad to welcome you to this act of worship today. We invite God to be with us in our thinking and praying, our singing and silence, our wondering and imagining. We offer to God our very best, for God is the great creator of life, the Lord of life, triumphant over death and always giving us the spirit of life to renew us. Thanks be to God. So please, imagine Jacob is sitting here before us today and let's hear his story told by the people in his life. We start with Jacob's immediate family, his mother, Rebekah his father, Isaac, and his twin brother, Esau, all of whom are joining us by video link. Jacob, from the very first moment, you were my number one. I know you were born second after your twin Esau, but it was always you I loved most. Esau was so red and hairy, and you so smooth and lovable. Throughout my pregnancy, I'd sensed that you were going to be very different children. You struggled together, gave me no peace. And then it seemed like it was a race to be born and your hand was gripping your brother's heel as you made your way into the world. That's why they insisted you were called Jacob, the grasper, the supplanter. Although to me, you were the follower, the one who needed extra love. So I gave that love to you all through your life. You stayed close beside me around the tents and you became a brilliant cook. It was no surprise to me that Esau swapped his birthright for a bowl of your stew. They were always delicious. Naturally, I shared with you whatever was going on. So when I heard your father Isaac telling Esau to catch some game and bring him a meal so that he could pass on his blessing, well, of course, I knew that it would be so much better if you received the blessing. You could do so much more with it than Esau with his rough ways. It was the work of a moment to kill a couple of kids from the flock cook them in Isaac's favourite recipe, dress you up in goat skins and make sure you were the one kneeling in front of your poor blind father. I know it meant you had to run away for a while. Well, in fact, I never saw you again. But you proved me right, Jacob. You've had an amazing life. I'm so proud of you. I never had a lot to say to you, Jacob, and it's no different today. To be honest, I thought you were a waste of space. You were a mummy's boy, always hanging around the tents, looking out for scraps, and not a food of gossip. You were a sly, deceitful child. Not like your brother Esau. He was strong and skillful, a man's man. He was the son I loved. I suppose the day I said the most to you was that fateful day when you stole what was rightfully his. And with the connivance of your mother, tricked me into giving you my blessing. If ever I rued my blindness, it was after that day. And I knew really I knew it wasn't Esau, but I was so disorientated by then, living in my tent, seeing so little and understanding even less. And so I asked God to give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of earth, 
prayed that people would serve you, even your own brother. And I brought down blessings on those who blessed you and curses on your enemies. Little knowing that would bounce right back into our family and divide us forever. Life lost what little meaning it had for me after that day. I let your mother do what she wanted and protect you. I was glad to send you away, especially to that trickster labor. You nearly met your match there. But there was no changing the facts. You were now the blessed one, whatever I wanted. Were we really brothers, Jacob? We weren't much like brothers, were we? We didn't play together, we didn't look out for each other, we didn't run races or compete for our parents' attention. We didn't need to. I had all of Dad's affection and interest, and you had all of Mum's. That's how it was, always. We knew that, even as very small boys. So we did our own things. I couldn't get away from the tents enough, always hunting or shooting or fishing. And you stayed home, helping Mummy, becoming a five-star chef. It was over food that our lives did connect. You needed me to catch the game, I needed you to turn it into those incredible stews. I sometimes wonder, looking back, if you'd always known that it would be through food that you would defeat me. Not once, but twice. You were always looking for an opportunity to get one over on me, and when it came, you seized it. I was so hungry that day, so ravenous. After hunting for what felt like days, I was fainting with hunger, and you wafted those cooking aromas around the tents, knowing I'd do anything for a good meal. Then you struck like a wild animal into its prey, like the supplanter that you are. And before the meal had hit my stomach, the birthright was yours. How could I be so stupid? My fault, really. That's what makes it so hard to swallow. But the next time, that was really sly. I knew it wasn't just you, I knew it was your mother as well. Our mother. But it was so unjust, so despicable, so... <sighs> I will never forget father's expression and voice when I came in with my meal only to discover I was too late. You broke his heart, Jacob, and you broke mine. After that, what was there for me to do but to marry the sort of woman my parents would hate and cause whatever trouble I could? In the end, we both did all right for ourselves, didn't we? Families, herds, flocks, lands, and eventually some sort of reconciliation. At least enough for father to die in peace. Strange how things work out. Strange indeed. A strange start to life for any child. And a strange relationship with blessing this surprising, almost shocking fact that God kept blessing Jacob, even when he behaved abominably, even when he didn't deserve it. Perhaps that word is the key to Jacob's life, deserve. I remember hearing a bishop once on the radio saying that the word deserve has no place in the Christian's vocabulary. For God's grace is never given according to what any of us deserve. And Jacob's story, like all our stories, is a story of grace. After those early incidents, Jacob did indeed run away, heading north for the 400 miles which his mother had travelled south decades earlier, when she had come to Canaan as a wife for Isaac. Along the way, Jacob had a profound experience, his first real encounter with God, at least as far as we know when he lies down on the ground for the night with a stone as his pillow to take some rest on his journey. There he dreams of a ladder reaching to heaven 
and angels ascending and descending on the ladder, and God standing beside him, promising to give him land and offspring, just as God had promised earlier to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac. When Jacob wakes from his dream, he says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He calls the place Bethel, the house of God, and makes a vow there that if God looks after him, then he will worship God. We'll see how all that worked out after we pause to reflect on God's grace at work in Jacob and available to be at work in us. Let's sing or listen to Singing the Faith 781. Take, oh take me as I am, summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh take me as I am, summon out what I shall be. Let us pray. God of grace, our limited minds fail to grasp just how wide is your mercy, just how deep is your love, just how vast is your kindness. We judge others, we judge ourselves. We are mean with our money, we are mean with our compassion. We take delight in the downfall of people we consider to be sinful. We excuse ourselves for our sinful thoughts and actions. We say sorry today and ask that your grace, the grace which went on blessing Jacob, may be given to us too, pressed down, shaken together and running over, that we may live our lives forgiven by your grace and blessed by your mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen. From Bethel, Jacob made his way to Haran, where, by a well, he met someone else who wants to say today, Jacob, this is another part of your life. We welcome Rachel, along with her father, Jacob's uncle Laban, and her sister, Leah. Rachel, over to you. Jacob, I don't think you have any idea about what my life was like before you arrived at the well that afternoon. I lived with my father, Laban, your uncle, my mother and my sister, Leah. I was in charge of the sheep. So every day I had to lead them out to the well, give them water and lead them back again, at least twice. Every day, gather the sheep, take them to the well, give them water, take them back. Then gather them again, take them to the well, give them water, take them back. Are you getting the idea? What's more, the stone over the well was too heavy for me to move, so I needed help from the other local shepherds, all of whom, whom were men and all of whom were, well, they were men. They said I was graceful and beautiful. I didn't tell them what they were. Then suddenly, on one of these mind-numbingly boring afternoon, where the sun was so hot I thought my feet would burn on the sand, as I approached the well, I could see there was a stranger there. The other shepherds were clustered around, pointing at me. I dreaded to think what they were saying, but then you were rolling the stone. You were watering my sheep. You were kissing me and weeping and telling me that we were cousins. I thought for a moment I'd passed out in the heat and was hallucinating, but it was all true. You really were a distant relation, and this wasn't just a passing visit. You were staying around. 
my life changed overnight. And when my father said that I was to be your wife in another seven years, it felt like a fairy tale. Not that everything which happened after that was idyllic. We had some hard times, didn't we? Dad marrying you to Leah before me so that I had to be wife number two when I knew that in your eyes I was always number one. And Leah being so horribly fertile while I had month after month of disappointment. The thing with the slave girl wasn't my best idea either. Though I noticed that Leah copied me again. But I always knew that you loved me. And I guess that kept me going until eventually Joseph was born. And I knew he would be your favourite too. I guess most parents have favourites. I think you said your mother did too. Jacob. What an unexpected pleasure to see you again. Always a pleasure to do business with you, my lad. Especially when I won. Although, fair play, you were a pretty mean opponent. High stakes, all or nothing. I like that sort of game. You had us in the palm of your hand, didn't you? My handsome, helpful, heroic nephew arriving out of the blue and spicing up our family life hotter than a vindaloo. The girls both fainting over you. Well, Rachel, anyway. Who knows what Leah really felt? So then, my nephew becomes my son-in-law, twice over. Not every day that that happens. Then, my general manager, and a very good one at that. There was always something about you, as if someone somewhere had your back. But always Jacob the supplanter too. You nearly overreached your hand when you ran off in the night with my entire family, and a lot of my goods. Not to mention the household gods. I never found them again, you know. Jacob the grasper. And I guess it takes one to know one. I wish you well, my lad. You didn't treat me well, Jacob. But you know that, don't you? Did I ask to be married off to you in the middle of the night? In a horrible buy one, get one free arrangement? Dreamt up by my well-meaning but insensitive father? No, I didn't. I could see how things were between you and Rachel. Did I want to be part of that? No, I didn't. Could I help it that I wasn't as stunning as my sister? No, I couldn't. You were numbered with me and I was numbered with you. So we had to make the best of it. We did have a few laughs though, didn't we? Now I'm thinking of the mandrakes now. And I used to laugh, looking at you and Dad together. If two men ever deserved each other, it was you two. Both as slippery as eels, both as greedy as goats. How you tried to cheat each other, again and again. But I guess you won in the end. You got the goods and the girls. All four of us, and the gods, of course. Though, I know that wasn't your doing. I'm not quite sure why Rachel wanted the house of gods. By then I'd certainly been won over by your strange one and one only god. And you got the requisite 12 sons. Not forgetting my poor, lovely Dinah. You changed after we left her around, didn't you? It was after that scary night by the Wadi Jabok. Scary for us, being sent on ahead without you. Scary for you, though you never told us what happened. We thought you were scared of Esau. But it wasn't that. For all his brawn, there was no threat in him. And as soon as we saw him run to you and the two of you kissing and weeping, we knew there wasn't any danger there. No, it was something bigger than Esau. Something deeper. Something wilder. I've often wondered about that. Yes, Leah, so have I. That strange wrestling match between Jacob and God, an angel, 
another man? The story is told in Genesis chapter 22 and it clearly is a defining moment in Jacob's life. Leah is quite right when she says that he was never the same again. We've seen how Jacob has spent his his whole life setting his own agenda, playing everyone and everything to his own advantage. He had that extraordinary dream about God at Bethel, but looking at the text, there isn't much evidence to suggest that that made a radical difference to how he lived his life. But now, returning to his homeland 20 years or so after he left, Hearing that his brother Esau is coming out to meet him with 400 men, remembering how they parted, now Jacob prays. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred and I will do you good. I'm not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. Jacob has remembered the words God spoke to him at Bethel about his descendants becoming as numerous as the sand of the sea. He's remembered that God promised to do him good and he's calling in those promises now in fear of his life. And a man comes and wrestles with him all night. Jacob is no pushover. We wouldn't expect that he would be and the stranger can't get the better of him. He dislocates Jacob's hip and then asks him his name. The last time someone in Genesis asked Jacob his name, he lied. He pretended to his father to be his brother Esau in order to secure the blessing of the firstborn. This time he tells the truth. Jacob, he replies. At this, the stranger changes Jacob's name, telling him he will now be called Israel, a name which means God strives, for he has striven against God and has prevailed. Extraordinary. Gradually, Jacob realises, and and so do we, that this man is something more than a man. This is God. The words of the hymn, Deep in the Darkness, a Starlight is Gleaming, 625 in Singing the Faith, seem to connect with this experience of Jacob's. Jan Berry invites us into that darkness of mystery and fear, of pain and confusion, to find a God of the questions, a God of the hurting, a God of the silence, and the God of our longing. We meditate on the words as we leave Jacob and the stranger together.
before we finish off Jacob's story, let's pause to pray, picking up on some of the scenarios in that moving hymn. Deep in the darkness, a starlight is gleaming, calling us out from the safety of home. We pray today for people who do not know safety in their home or anywhere for all who are subjected to violence and control in their domestic relationships, for all who flee their homeland for fear of persecution, torture and death, for all who have nowhere to call home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Out of the darkness, the voices are crying terror and fear screaming loud in the night. We pray today for people who are crying, imprisoned by fear, for all caught up in the horror of war, in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Israel, in too many countries, for all victims of human trafficking, exploited, degraded, humiliated, for all subjected to any kind of discrimination, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Still in the darkness, we search for your healing, hoping for meaning to comfort our fear. We pray today for all in need of healing, frightened by symptoms and disease, for all known to us who are in pain today, desperate for release from anguish, for all in our society whose minds are troubled, crying out for relief and for peace. For all across the world who are alienated from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our longing, the bliss we are seeking, journey with all to the brightness of day. Amen. And so Jacob leaves the place, limping because of his hip, but perhaps never more whole than he is now. He knows that he has seen God face to face and yet lived to tell the tale. The coming encounter with his brother pales into insignificance, and indeed, as Lear observed, there is no threat from that direction. Jacob is a changed man at last. Although not above one final bit of subterfuge, to avoid returning entirely to the bosom of his family. What, I wonder, would God say about Jacob, if invited now to take part in Jacob, this is your life? It's tempting to ask that question, but maybe the question I need to be asking is, what would God say about me, if invited now to take part in Jill, this is your life, or yours? Slot in your own name and ask the question. How might God sum up our involvement with, our devotion to, our turning the back on, our falling in love with, our developing understanding of, our own journey with God over the years of our lives? The amazing thing is that God would not say what we deserve to hear, but would continue to offer blessing and grace, just as God did to Jacob all the years of his life. Blessing and grace, grace and blessing, the oil and fragrance of our lives, always poured out by a generous, loving God. This is the nature of God demonstrated supremely in the life of Jesus. Blessing and grace, grace and blessing. This is the nature of God constantly offered to us in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Blessing and grace, grace and blessing. All we can do in response is to offer ourselves. We finish our worship with Matt Redman's Song of Dedication, 446 in Singing the Faith, I Will Offer Up My Life.
you for worshipping with the Strathclyde Circuit today. New acts of worship go live every Sunday from 7am. We close with a blessing and with the grace. May the God of Rebecca and Isaac show you favour. May the God of Leah and Laban grant you a sense of humour. May the God of Rachel and Jacob always surround you with love. And may the God of Canaan, Bethel, Haran and Peniel always go before you, beside you, behind you and beneath you, this day and forevermore. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.